Two of arguably the biggest cash grabs clash swords and sabers this week as The Hobbit takes on the Star Wars prequels. Welcome back to Movie Feuds. So many forgettable characters, it's hard to know where to begin. Let's start with the Star Wars camp. One character is present in all three films and stands on the shoulders of gods. He rises above all others and he's present in all three films. A curious and playful little c that goes by the name of Jar Jar Binks. Misa think I'm a f***ing idiot. Misa be correct. This character was created for the sole purpose to sell children's merch. Short for merchandise, I hate him. Jar Jar Dinks is just one of the many reasons why these new films fail to live up to their 70s counterparts. Joining that list would be both sets of Anakin Skywalker. First, we have the great teen acting from Jake Lloyd, who appears to have never bothered practicing any of his lines. Then there's Anakin, aka future Darth Vader. This is a man who will one day choke bitches out with his mind. He will be both feared and respected equally. He will command armies. So why the f do I just see a whiny little teenager crying every five minutes? God damn it, Lucas! Let's talk about some of the good characters for a sec because there are a few. Queen Amidala slash Padme was played by the stunning Natalie Portman. She was also played by Kira Knightley as her stunt double. That's a fun little fact for you. That's an Adam fact out here on Movie Feuds. You're welcome. Subscribe. Portman's great when she's acting Han Solo, but she's terrible in every scene she's in with Hayden. That's due to the script more than anything else, so I'm gonna give her a pass. The only thing they got right was giving her the ridiculous excuse to rock a midriff in Clone Wars. Oh, careful, careful alien who cut my shirt perfectly so that my stomach's showing. Now I'm rocking a tummy tee. It happens all the time. The best character in the entire prequel franchise is Qui-Gon, played by badass Liam Neeson. So naturally he dies in episode one. Ewan McGregor is solid as Obi-Wan, but once more directionless. It was great to see some of the originals back, like C-3PO, R2-D2, and Yoda. Boba Fett's back, terribly utilized, but the clone army was cool, so that's, that's something. I was always really confused why Boba Fett was this awesome guy to begin with. He has like 10 seconds of screen time in the original franchise. He's killed off like a dumbass who was flying into a Sarlacc pit. Awesome, I guess? The Hobbit has a nice range of solid and terrible characters as well. I can tell you the names of almost none of them. That speaks volumes as I can easily remember the main cast of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Some of them make their way back, even ones that weren't in the Hobbit books to my knowledge. I of course didn't read the Hobbit books because I'm illiterate, but I trust everything I read on the internet. Returning cast includes the amazing Ian McKellen reprising his role as Gandalf the now grayer than ever. Legolas is for some reason in the last two installments because Legolas. Now he's a full-on video game character, but lost the personality from Lord of the Rings. Zero smiles cracked. He still fights like a pit bull covered in sharks though. Circus is back as the cave-dwelling Gollum, then we have Hugo Weaving, Kate Blanchett, and a cameo by Ian Holm and Elijah Wood. New cast includes Sherlock's Martin Freeman as our hobbit of the picture, Bilbo, who's by far the best thing in the new franchise. Kate from Lost plays a female Legolas, because I mean, what's better than one neck-snapping elf? Two. That's what. Sherlock himself, Benedict Cumberbatch, voices the money-grubbing dragon Smog in parts 2 and 3. Then there's Thor and the lead dwarf, and with him his merry group of forgettable companions. I know there's Oldie, Fatty, one that wants to show Kate his smoke monster. Terrible Lost reference. Subscribe. I've seen the Star Wars prequels exactly two times. Once to see Star Wars films, and a second to figure out if what I just watched was actually Star Wars films. Who the f*** thought intergalactic tax trading was a good idea? From what I could gather, that's one of the major plot threads. I remember two things from episode one. Darth Maul is cool as shit, and the pod racing is half the movie. Clone Wars has a bit more intrigue with the whole clone army premise, but then we have the end with Yoda flipping around like Kermit the Frog on crack, fighting someone named Count Dooku or Count Chocula or some other serial mascot. Third act of this prequel cluster takes place in some sort of a volcano planet. Meanwhile, Panda Bear dies of a broken heart giving birth to her twins. She dies of a broken heart. An adult wrote this. I think one of the final shots in the film summarizes everything completely. The Hobbit films are fun and empty. They're padded out all over the place. There's multiple songs, trolls impersonating the Three Stooges, 
Rock'em Sock'em Mountains, terrible comic relief editions, and Lord of the Rings references rammed down our throats. I think this could have been a great two act, but of course Hollywood dragon greed rears its ugly head and we have an extended journey in Middle Earth. As much disdain as I have towards the prequel films, I'm not pig-headed enough to ignore the fact that the effects are beautiful at times. George Lucas has always pushed the technical side of filmmaking and the prequels carry on that tradition. Fully rendered CGI'd worlds, much stronger saber battles, elaborate character and vista designs, new and unique planets and creatures to see, and who can forget that lovable Jar Jar? Hopefully everyone. Granted all these updates take me out of the picture rather than make it more immersive. Most of the sequences where action doesn't take place are just two or three people walking in front of a green screen. It feels half-baked and extremely experimental, almost lazy at times. There's no interaction with the surroundings. Everything is a static backdrop, a desktop wallpaper with the people in the foreground doing little more than spewing out mediocre lines of dialogue. So it's basically this show. The Hobbit films do much better here, but maybe not for the reasons you think. The CGI is way overcooked. Far more is used than in the Lord of the Rings series, possibly due to a way tighter deadline. The difference is, Jackson knows how to move a camera and light up his material. You know you're looking at fake shit in these movies, but at least it's interesting fake shit. And both of these franchises have a treasure trove of action. There are crazy chases, large scale wars, dragons, arena battles, God of War references, barrel brawling, one on one fights, one on two fights, man against machine, eagle on org, gungan on droid. This is starting to sound like some sick sexual fanfic. And I'm all in. If nothing else, just watch that Darth Maul fight on repeat. That's the entire value of the Star Wars prequels. Seriously, that end duel is amazing thanks to great choreography and an even better score. Transition. Go to round four. John Williams came back to finish what he started. If there's one thing that the prequels did right, and I believe there is only one thing, it's the music. In fact, Duel of the Fates is my favorite Star Wars song to date. The music tells a story ten times as epic as the one Lucas put on screen. The original soundtrack is of course sprinkled throughout, there's hints of it, but Duel takes it to an entirely different level, which is level 10, the maximum amount anything can achieve ever. Like John Williams, Howard Short too came back to complete his masterwork, this time bringing with him two orchestras, one from New Zealand and the other from London. The music's all very well done, but it doesn't quite hit the grandeur levels Lord of the Rings did. Is it grandeur? Grandeur? I really don't know English that well. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's possibly intentional since this isn't near the scope the later adventures are. One does not simply give the Star Wars prequel movies praise, but in the music department, it's deserved. How shall this day end? If it isn't painfully obvious by this point that I'm not a big fan of the newer Star Wars films, then you are an idiot. Do I think they're bad movies? Pretty much, yes. They feel like a very large cash grab by a man who lost touch with what made his original picture so gripping. There are almost no memorable characters outside the ones that die in Act 1, except for f***ing Jar Jar, who not only lives through all three films, but manages to rise in the ranks to the Senate? really enjoyed my time with the Hobbit flicks, but the Lord of the Rings, they are not. Jackson relies heavily on old favorites to keep us interested and brings nothing new or exciting to the table. Just seeing Legolas do a bunch of insane crap like defy gravity and jump up stones as they're falling, I mean that's fun. It's, it's dumb as hell, but it's fun as hell. What did you think of both prequels? That's really what matters. Did they live up to the hype or fall flat for you? And since YouTube's comment system is more broken than a stripper's mental stability, I suggest you come over to FewNation.com. Join me there. It's a brand new website. It's still very much in production, but I'm putting all the newest episodes there and I'll eventually get all the backlog put into place. I'm also on Patreon. I'm not doing a very good job of promoting it, obviously. It's, it's a pretty sad state over there. But if you like Feud Nation, if you like what I'm doing, I'd love to see some support from you guys so I could continue this uh, show. And with all that said, this is more than just reviews, this is Movie Feuds, and welcome to Season 5. <laughs>